Hello and welcome to part 5 of History Boffin's South Africa playlist, where our focus is diamonds, gold and British imperialism. Chronologically speaking, we are looking at the period from the late 1860s until 1899, and I am paraphrasing a chapter of Leonard Thompson's Outstanding History of South Africa because it really does capture the key themes of this period. I've added one word, concerted, to provide a clearer distinction to the reluctant British imperialism that we considered in part four of our playlist. During this period, British men on the spot in southern Africa often had the backing of their superiors in London, and this led to a far more aggressive policy concerning the region. We start with the discoveries that kicked off a chain of events that were to lead to the start of the Second Boer War, or South African War, in 1899. Let's just recap where we left off last video. Both the Boer republics and British colonies were relatively well established by the 1860s, though there were some independent Griqua and Bantu territories. The important thing to note is that British annexation had most often been a reluctant process, and when independence was granted to the two Boer states, the South African Republic to the north of the Vaal River and the Orange Free State to the south of it, it was done so in the belief that these lands were not worth much. The lands were not particularly productive agricultural land, and deposits of minerals were seemingly scarce. Furthermore, the Boer territories were cut off from ports, and investment in railways was unlikely. The official British point of view was that they had already secured the best land in the region, and didn't need to invest further economic, administrative and military resources into southern Africa when they had far more important imperial assets, such as India. All this changed when surface diamonds were discovered in the rural territory belonging to the Griquas, that mixed group of Cape Coloureds who had created their own communities in Khoisan land in the 18th and early 19th centuries. This particular territory, Griqua land west, had been recognised by the British in 1834 under the leadership of Andreas Waterbore. There was little desire on the part of both British and Boers to annex this land, which did not yield much at all. However, when diamonds were discovered in 1867, and even more in 1872, that attitude changed. The land was now valuable, and control of it was considered vital. By 1867 and the discovery of diamonds, Griqualand West was now supposedly ruled by Nicholas Waterbore, the son of Andreas Waterbore, though his title of captain was more symbolic than meaningful. There had been conflicting claims to the land from Boers, Griquas and local Twana tribes for some time, but arguments over who should control Griqualand West began in earnest in 1870 with the first president of the South African Republic, Martinus Vessel Pretorius, claiming control of the territory and attempting to establish an administration over the mining community. In fact, it was no surprise that the Boers felt they had a strong claim. The region was full of Africana farms, and while the British had recognised the Waterboer claim in 1834, the Boers had not. However, as the situation had been countless times in southern Africa, real power lay with the men on the spot, and in this case it was the large British mining union known as the Mutual Protection Association. They rejected Boer control of the diamond mines, and in July 1870, Stafford Parker became the first and only president of a Diamond Diggers Republic, also known as the Clip Drift Republic. This was just a small part of Griqualand West, but it did lead to more and more British miners moving in to try and make their fortune. The Boers now turned to negotiation to try and gain control of the territory. However, in 1871, a British committee, which had been set up in order to mediate and make a decision on the competing claims, ruled in favour of Nicholas Waterbore. Taking its name from the chair of the committee, the Lieutenant Governor of Natal, the Keat Award was in fact a smokescreen, and the British had persuaded Nicholas Waterbore to request British protection as soon as the ruling was made in his favour. This he duly did, and so the British took control in October 1871. The Boers continued to claim ownership of the land, 
and eventually an 1875 land court set up by the Cape Colony caused uproar by rejecting most of Waterbore's original claims to Greekwa land west. Ultimately, the Boers accepted financial compensation in 1876 from Britain. It was clear that territories of value were going to be argued over by the Whites. Thus, Griqualand became a British colony. In 1877, it formally became part of Cape Colony, and its political representatives were to a man mining magnates. Critically, within Cape Colony, politics was now deeply linked to industry, and this was no better illustrated than the election of Cecil Rhodes, the preeminent figure in the diamond industry, as Prime Minister of Cape Colony in 1890. Political decisions increasingly took into account commercial interests rather than the previous emphasis on stability. Economically, Cape Colony was transformed, and in order to transport materials and labour to the mines, after 1872, a railway from Cape Town to Kimberley was laid. Arguably, however, the most significant developments were in the labour laws that governed the mines. Pressure from white miners led to a colour bar being created, through which no black African could ascend to a skilled, managerial and better paid role. In the 1870s, these Africans were required to carry passes and live in all-male compounds for the duration of their contract. The origins of South Africa's migrant labour and segregated labour systems are to be found in the diamond mines of Griqualand. We'll return to the theme of mining shortly. In fact, the disagreement over Griqualand West betrayed serious differences between Africana and British points of view that were to dominate the next two decades. The idea formulated by Lord Carnarvon, the British colonial secretary in the mid-1870s, to confederate both British and Boer territories under one banner was doomed to failure due to these different points of view. Ironically, however, these differences led to the annexation of key Bantu-speaking lands by the British. The rejection of Carnarvon's plan for confederation by Afrikaners led him to instruct British agents in South Africa to force British control on the Boer states. Thus, in 1877, Theophilus Shepstone, Natal's Secretary for Native Affairs, acted on Carnarvon's instructions and managed to assume control of the bankrupt South African Republic. In order to win Africana support for British control of the South African Republic, he supported their claims to neighbouring Zulu land and pushed the argument that Zulu men would be better utilised as labourers than as warriors. Shepstone persuaded the British High Commissioner to order the Zulu chief, Setuayo, to disband his army. As we learned in our video on the Mefikani, the Zulus were a highly militarised society and they were always going to reject the British demand to disarm. Setuayo mobilised about 30,000 men. A month later, about 7,000 British troops, supported by roughly the same number of Natal Africans, under the command of Lord Chelmsford, invaded Zululand. At the Battle of Zanduana, 1,300 British troops were butchered by a huge Zulu force of whom most had spear and shield. The British had not created any proper defences at their camp and had split up their force, arrogantly assuming that no indigenous force could match a disciplined line of British troops with rifles. This humiliating defeat led to a jingoistic second invasion as the British public clamoured for revenge and the British government aimed to destroy any notion that its imperial forces were weak. This time, aided by reinforcements and the desire to regain a damaged reputation before his replacement arrived, Chelmsford marched on the royal village of Alundi and decisively defeated the Zulus. Setuayo was imprisoned and though he returned to Zulu territory in time, the splitting up of Zulu land into 13 rival tribal territories meant that they were never a threat to the whites again. On the contrary, Africana seizure of Zulu land became so severe that the British feared Afrikaners might be able to gain independent access to a port, and so they annexed the territory in 1887. Therefore, the Zulu Empire was carved up between the two white groups in South Africa. 
This was repeated several times during the 1870s, 1880s and 1890s. A combination of internecine wars, fears over German settlers and difficulties maintaining law and order saw the various Griqua and Bantu territories east of Cape Colony fall under direct British rule. Over fears that Afrikaners were moving westward through Tuana territory and might eventually link with German Southwest Africa, in 1885 the British annexed a substantial territory and called it British Bechuana land. Finally, even though Britain agreed to Afrikaner control of Swaziland in 1895, it prevented the Boers from access to the sea as a means of maintaining greater economic control of the Boer republics. Thus, by the 1890s, all the land in South Africa was under white control and the only remaining question concerned whether the rival white groups could live harmoniously or not. This question was somewhat answered when, in 1886, the largest gold deposits ever found were discovered just south of Pretoria at the Witwatersrand. As we have discussed in this video and in previous ones, there were substantial differences between British and Afrikaner values and aims. Remember, the Voortrekkers had left British territory in the 1830s in order to build independent Afrikaner states, and the period since had seen increasing rivalry between the two white groups. You'll recall that in 1877 Theophilus Shepstone had engineered a British takeover of the South African Republic, but by 1880, inept British rule, and the removal of the Zulu threat to Afrikaners led to a brief conflict in which the Afrikaners defeated the small and poorly led British forces, leading to the new Liberal government in Britain granting independence once more to the South African Republic. Five years later, when gold beyond people's wildest dreams was discovered in the Witwatersrand, the independence of the Transvaal became a hot topic. While the gold mines were developed using predominantly European capital, including substantial sums from Cecil Rhodes, the Prime Minister of Cape Colony after 1890. Political power rested with Afrikaners. The President, Paul Kruger, had been a boy during the Great Trek, had fought the British in 1880 and 1881, was deeply religious and firmly believed in Afrikaner supremacy over blacks. Above all else, he wanted political independence from Britain, and linked to this encouraged economic independence, for instance by trading through Portuguese Mozambique rather than British territory. Meanwhile, Britons were the majority of over 40,000 Europeans who descended on Johannesburg, the newly founded City of Gold, to work in the mines and its connected industries. In time, these Europeans became known as outlanders, in other words, different to Afrikaners, and by the late 1880s, Kruger had agreed to the vote being restricted to citizens who had been in the territory for 14 years. British imperial policy became more aggressive after the 1895 appointment of Joseph Chamberlain as Secretary of State for Colonies. He firmly believed that Britain had to control the Boer republics one way or another. Chamberlain's first attempt at controlling the Boer republics was a fiasco, and another humiliation for the British. He facilitated a plot that Rhodes had secretly been working on alongside his close associate Leander Starr Jameson, whereby a secret reform committee would mobilise outlanders against the Transvaal government, leading to civil disorder. Jameson would then ride into the territory with several hundred police officers of the British South Africa Company, which Rhodes owned, to restore order. Following this, it was envisaged that the British High Commissioner would be invited to Pretoria to arbitrate over the dispute, and the Transvaal would be made a British colony. The reality was a disaster. The Reform Committee never took off and actually tried to negotiate with Kruger. Boer commandos were launched to engage Jameson and the British force, who surrendered on 2nd of January 1896. While the British were humiliated, the significant consequences were actually behind the scenes. Kruger made further political reforms to strengthen Afrikaner power and imported large stocks of weapons from Europe. He also began to build an alliance with the other Boer Republic, the Orange Free State. Meanwhile, Chamberlain cleverly covered up his role in the Jameson raid, but resolved to take further action to curb Afrikaner power in the region. In our next video, we'll consider the end product 
of these developments that we've learned about, the South African War. We've discussed the thesis, antithesis and synthesis model of essay writing and we can now use this model to help us answer the question, discuss the reasons for the South African War of 1899 to 1902. Let's turn our attention to the component parts of our essay. The traditional view, first put forward by Hobson, is that economic motives were behind imperialist conflicts, and there is some value in this argument. The British were far less concerned with expanding territory until diamonds were discovered in Griqualand West and gold was discovered in the South African Republic. It was the desire for wealth and the control that was needed to ensure this that caused the war, according to this viewpoint. The revisionist antithesis has placed more emphasis on the actions of British individuals. Their concern was the protection of the British Empire against growing threats, such as Germany. This more strategic analysis would place emphasis on the fact the British tried to assume control of the Transvaal before gold was even discovered, and the conquest of Bantu lands had little to do with capitalism and more to do with security. Thus, we develop a synthesis. British and Boers were concerned with carving a secure place in southern Africa for much of the 19th century. There was a hugely complex system of overlapping territorial claims, tribal rivalries and white settler movement. This was set against the backdrop of a growing scramble for Africa, which Britain was particularly concerned about. However, until diamonds and gold were discovered, British expansion was reluctant, reactive and slow. It was the newfound wealth of the region that led to a more assertive British policy of control. This directly contradicted the long-standing Afrikaner aim of independence from Britain at all costs. The actions of Kruger, Chamberlain and Rhodes directly stemmed from their national concerns and their inability to reconcile with the opposing concern. As ever, thanks for watching and please subscribe by pressing the red subscribe button below. These videos not only help anyone studying South African history, but are designed to provide a straightforward overview of a fascinating topic to anyone who is interested.